Hello there, I'm Hala Mohyuddin and this is Counting the Cost on Al Jazeera, your look at the world of business and economics. This week, the return of big governments, Biden spending trillions, taxing the rich and corporations, giving away patents for vaccines to supercharge the economy and global growth. Will that lead to a rise in inflation? Prices are rising all along the supply chain and so are wages. But it's not an equal global recovery amid an unequal vaccine program. And when the billions in revenue just aren't enough and Generation Z switches off, football's business model wasn't working before the pandemic and it's not working now. Raise taxes for the rich and corporations to pay for not only the post-pandemic recovery, but levelling up the widening gap between the richest and the poorest in society. It sounds like a no-brainer, seeing as the wealthiest US citizens have made more than $4 trillion last year from stock market gains. But President Joe Biden's plans to spend trillions of dollars on the recovery also tells us that the Reagan-era accepted consensus of trickle-down economics may be at an end. And big government is back more than two decades after Bill Clinton declared it was over. Well, Biden's plans to spend $2.3 trillion on infrastructure and $1.8 trillion on improving education and training have echoes of Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal during the Depression in the 1930s. It's not only a US phenomenon, one of Prime Minister Boris Johnson's plans for levelling up disadvantaged areas in the north of England was to spend billions of dollars on infrastructure programmes. Separately, a report commissioned by Johnson ahead of the G7 meeting in June said the world's richest countries should invest $10 trillion to stoke a green recovery and provide vaccines. And a similar splurge could be underway on the European continent with plans to distribute 750 billion euros in grants and loans to national governments. Italy's Prime Minister Mario Draghi is banking on the 261 billion euros to revive the moribund economy. His spending plans could boost the economy by 3.6 per cent by 2026. But all these plans may have unintended side effects. Inflation. While stock markets have hit record highs, they're jittery about the prospect of runaway inflation and central banks withdrawing support through cheap money. Fed Chair Jerome Powell expects higher inflation will be transitory, arguing that the labour market remains 8.4 million jobs below its peak in February 2020. Well, there's a lot to unpack here, so let's bring in two experts to help us do just that. Kaya Parv is Head of Investment Research at FX Primus. She joins us from Limassol in Cyprus. And Robert Janeiro is the Director of Black Square International and a visiting fellow at the London School of Economics. He joins us from London. Uh, Robert, to you first, do you think this is a temporary return uh, to big spending governments or is, could this be something more permanent? Yeah, it certainly feels a little bit more permanent, doesn't it? Um, I think you know, governments have spent a lot of money over the last year getting through the pandemic and now thinking, well, how do we recover? Uh, and therefore are going to spend a lot more money going forward to try and stimulate their economies and take lots of infra infrastructure and spending uh, to grow or attempt to grow their ways out of, out of the recessions that they've had. Uh, Kaya, do you, the big fear with this stimulus is that it is going to cause inflation. That hasn't gone down very well, has it? Especially after Janet Yellen, the US Treasury Secretary, said interest rates would need to rise. Comments that she has since walked back. What's your view? I mean, definitely, given the size of stimulus um, from the central banks as well as the federal government, we're going to have pick up in inflation at some point. However, I do think that maybe the fears are a bit overstated at this point. And looking at yesterday's inflation number as well, um, it's larger concentrated in those cyclical areas of the economy. But uh, given the amount of stimulus, it's only natural um, that we're going to have some sort of price increases and also on a durable basis, not just one time shift in a price level. Um, Robert, it's interesting here that we're talking about the huge investment that the uh, richer countries are, are funneling into the economy, and yet many developing nations 
are already working on, on, on clawing some of these debts back, as we saw with Colombia. What's your take on this? It's, it's a really mixed picture. Um, as you say, you know, wealthy countries are saying, oh, we're going to build, we're going to digitalise, we're going to combat climate change and have green investment. But then a lot of that, um, as, as uh, Kai just said, is tied to what people are buying and the demand you, you have for certain commodities, so steel, copper, rare earth metals, that come from typically uh, emerging markets. So, you know, and emerging markets are still in the grip of, of the coronavirus. They're nowhere near as well insulated as the rest of the world or, or the advanced, you know, the developed world has been. Um, in terms of vaccine rollouts and preparedness and implementation, their infrastructure just isn't as good. So that's a really difficult picture. On one hand, they've got you know much greater demand for what they sell in emerging markets, but obviously fewer people available to do it. And then I guess on the last side, you've got the domestic um, aspects of, of, of countries. I'm thinking about North Africa here, and even to some extent the Gulf region, where you know. Those economies are reliant on tourism or um, extractives, and you know tourists aren't back yet, and, and so their, their budgets have been blown through. Um, and now they're thinking, well, how do we recover from that, or do we issue more debt? And I mean, issuing debt's okay as long as it's spent wisely and you're able to pay it back. Well, it doesn't look to be that that's going to always be the case. So at some point, you're going to have some problems uh, in terms of you know. Matching, matching that need that emerging markets definitely have for investment uh, and, and the debt that they need to issue to achieve it, and obviously at the end paying for it. Uh, Kaya, how tolerant would you say investors are to the debt which has been accumulated during this crisis? Should poorer nations be worried about credit scores being downgraded? Um, definitely a problem for uh, poorer countries, although weaker dollar at this point, and again, uh, those countries that export uh, commodities are slightly better positioned. However, I think at some point, some sort of de debt relief definitely has to be on the table, uh, which is complicated given the, uh, the structure of investors for poorer countries. Um, IMF, World Bank and G20 are maybe slightly more open to, to relieve some of the debt, but uh, private investors, let's say, such as hedge funds or institutional investors on the pension side, uh, they have fiduciary duty towards their own investors. And I think that complicates a lot of those restructuring discussions. Uh, Robert, let's talk vaccines. What are the drawbacks to the recovery will be the distribution of vaccines? Now, Joe Biden has offered to relax patent laws. Do you think this is really going to help speed up the recovery? You would hope so, but again, it, you know, it comes down to that supply chain issue of manufacturing, distribution, immunisation, and then repeat. So it's not just as simple as patents. It's, it's a good step. It means that countries that don't presently have the contractual ability to manufacture and distribute the vaccines can. Um, but at the same time, you know, is it going to solve everything? No, it's not. Uh, so it's a good step, but again, it's only going to be a temporary step. Uh, you know, you're not going to see big IP changes across across the board. Um, so it, it, it's a nice and welcome thing, but it will help. But I don't think it's going to solve the problem either. Well, who do you think it's going to help? Because if you look at India, they're one of the top 10 richest economies, certainly known for their vaccines, uh, development, distribution and production. Uh, but the reality on the ground, as we've seen in news bulletins, is very, very different indeed, is it not? It is a really interesting case. Obviously, they've been producing much of the world's vaccine, so it's ironic, so saddening that they're also the ones that are now having the biggest problem with the coronavirus. I mean, if you look at the Indian economy, its composition, it's a deeply uneven society. You've got huge wealth disparity. You've got millions and millions of Indians who are poor, and you know they just they live in, in, in completely undeveloped um, towns and cities that need you know basic infrastructure investment. Uh, for their lives. And that's part, part and parcel of the reason why coronavirus has been able to spread. It's not just about the adherence to the rules that the Indian government created. It's also about the ability of the Indian infrastructure and health infrastructure to care for people. And let's not forget there's 1.1, 1.2 billion Indian people. So it's a huge country um, it, it, in that particular case. I mean, you, you would hope it would help India, but I think that wider rollout, how is it going to help the Congo? How is it going to help you know, Central African um, countries? How is it going to help Central 
um, American countries, that is less clear. And yet, we, you know, if everyone has the coronavirus or the ability to carry it, then we all have to be immunised from it. That's going to take a very long time to achieve. Um, Kaya, Joe Biden is keen to, keen to relax these patent laws. Germany, on the other hand, is not. And the early reaction uh, in Germany was a sell-off. How do you explain this? I mean, Angela Merkel has taken a uh, much stronger stance towards the IP protection, uh, whereas Joe Biden definitely is more open to communication and, and uh, making sure that poorer countries have access to vaccine. But exactly like Robert mentioned, um, just releasing the IP is, is one part of it. It's, it's more difficult to procure actually the ingredients needed and then having the facility in order to produce. Um, so... The, the idea is great. However, I think the execution will prove to be much more difficult uh, than we actually imagine at this stage. Uh, let's take a broader view now. Robert, there has been a rapid bounce back in, in many parts uh, of the world, but we are a long way from recovering all the jobs that have been lost. Uh, what, in your view, needs to happen? That demand supply um, aspect of the global economy is is really interesting. Some people have lost their jobs and can't find other ones. You know, some people have done really well from asset price inflation in stock markets, in commodities, in property. It's a very uneven um, distribution of, of wealth. And that's at country levels, that's regionally, that's in the EU, in America. That seems to be pretty universal. Um, you know, For many people around the world, or most of the world, they derive their money from what they earn, not from the assets that they own. So, you know, I think it comes down to paying people more, um, upskilling them, helping them grow, actually improving businesses and helping them grow as well, which can't just be about loans. You know, it has to be more than that. It has to be demand-led. Uh, you can't just keep growing economies on debt because eventually you've got to pay it off or write it off. And it's interesting seeing people now afraid of inflation. Stock markets are being sold off because of inflation we rise. When the last 10 years, all we've wanted is inflation and all we've got is deflation. So you know, we need some inflation. We need that demand and we need it to be more even. It can't just occur in asset bubbles. It can't just happen in property, stock markets and commodities. It needs to be broader than that. OK, Kaya, final question to you. Is the European Union, in your view, lagging behind the United States in this recovery? And do you think they can get this massive 750 billion euro plan signed off? It's uh, funny to hear a number referring to 700 billion nowadays as huge because looking at US, we see trillions worth of stimulus coming out and, and the markets still think we need more. Um, so, but coming back to the question, EU is definitely behind in terms of the fiscal stimulus. Uh, we need all member, steps, member states to ratify the, uh, the recovery fund. And I think from there, it has to be extremely aggressive implementation. And I like the sort of tiers that the EU wants to focus on from uh, green energy perspective, but also digitalization of the economies. But I think it's, it's a long way to go. Um, and it's very hard to achieve if Europe remains as fractioned as we are at this point. OK, we'll have to leave it there. Uh, but lots of food for thought. Thanks to both of you. Uh, Kaya Parv, uh, Head of Investment Research at FX Primus, and Robert Gennaro, Director of Black Square International. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It took the dirty dozen less than 48 hours to kill off their European Super League after a backlash from supporters. The dash for cash by some of Europe's biggest clubs had little to do with saving the beautiful game as younger viewers switch off and more to do with the billionaire owners locking in perpetual revenue streams. Europe's top 20 revenue-generating clubs made a combined 8.2 billion euros, that's close to $10 billion, in the 2019-2020 season. Now that's down from 9.3 billion euros in the year before the pandemic. It's true the pandemic has hit clubs hard. The English Premier League has lost $600 million in revenue, but that didn't stop them from spending $900 million in recruiting players during the summer. Even before the pandemic, clubs were in trouble as wages were sucking up more and more of their income. Half of the Premier League team spent more than 70% of their income on wages. 
Take Manchester City this year's Premier League winners. They earned £478.4 million and paid wages of £351 million. That's about 73% of its income. So should you be surprised that the club made a loss of £125.1 million? Well, joining us by Skype from Coventry is Simon Chadwick, Director of the Centre for the Eurasian Sport Industry at the EM Leon Business School. Good to have you with us on the programme, Simon. Football's taken in huge sums of money from broadcast rights and they've mostly uh, been uh, going into player wages at the expense of profitability. So do you think it's now time for a salary cap? Financially, and, and one might even say morally, uh, there has to be an argument for, for salary capping. Um, if we look at some of the world's uh, highest paid players, we are talking about hundreds of thousands of pounds worth of salary per week, let alone per month or per year. And so there is a, a compelling set of arguments um, that, that point to the need for a cap. But there are really two things that I would point out. The, the first thing is we, we're talking about a group of people who have a very distinctive skill set. Um, not unlike surgeons or engineers, uh, there are very few extremely talented players in the world. And, and so under normal free market laws, uh, that's what happens is, is when they, they have um, uh, rare skills, um, people generally have to pay more to acquire those skills. I think the second thing, too, is in legal terms across the world, there are different pictures. So, for instance, in the European Union, it would be very, very hard to impose a salary cap for legal reasons because the the common argument would be in a court of law in Europe is you, you don't sal salary cap chief executives, you don't sal salary cap doctors. So why are you discriminating in salary capping players? And so whilst many people will be calling out for a salary, salary cap across the world, in reality, it's actually logistically, legally and practically very difficult to implement. Well, one of the reasons given for the European Super League was audiences, especially Generation Z, uh, who apparently weren't very interested in watching football. What do you say to that? For people like me, um, who some people might label as hardcore fans, we were born with a club and we will die with a club. And, and there are lots of people like me, not just of my age, but of other ages too. But what we're beginning to see is a, is a, a new generation of consumer uh, and, and, and a new generation of um, sport fan emerge. And these are people who have never known life without the internet. Um, they're increasingly consuming content on demand. And, and so the nature of their fandom is changing. One of the things that we've found from, from our research is, is that whereas historically people would identify with, with football teams, nowadays Generation Z is, for instance, identifying more with players. And so when a player moves club, they also will move club and, and follow the player rather than stay with the team. Um, and, and, and if we keep in mind, too, that Generation Z isn't the end of this, in many ways it's just the start. We have Generation Alpha, and Generation Alpha, you know, these these are these these young people are seven or eight year, years old right now. Um, they're watching on demand on tablets. They're playing esports, uh, and so the kind of traditional associations that people like me might have with football, uh, you know, seven year olds and seventeen year olds right now don't necessarily have the same predisposition towards not just. Uh, football in general, but but the kind of clubs that historically fans would associate with. So if the solution to this problem isn't the European Super League, what is the solution then to capture Generation Z and Generation Alpha? Is it more streaming? The interesting thing is, is, is I think all of us need to realise that we're living in the middle of a revolution. Uh, we're living in the middle of a digital revolution. Uh, we're also living in, in, in the middle of a really what you would call a global revolution. So you know, th those kind of old industrial heartlands of, indu of, of European football that, that many of us were born and brought up in, um, which dates back to the 19th century and the Industrial Revolution. You know, in many ways, these days are over. Um, we're living a new era where, yes, more content uh, being made available digitally in really flexible ways is, is one part of it. I think linked to it, there, there are developments in over-the-top broadcasting, but there, there are also developments in, in, for example, augmented reality. 
and it's very you know very likely that at some stage over the next five to ten years you know we may well be watching sport and, and, and football using some kind of headset that takes us deep inside the stadium when a game is taking place so you know we're very much living in a in a state of flux te- uh, technologically and digitally but I think at the same time we also need to understand that people's lifestyles are changing um, as we've seen throughout the pandemic with the, with the, the growth of, of for example Netflix the way in which people um, consume uh, uh, audiovisual content is very different now, even to, to just a year or two years ago. Um, we, we want it to be flexible. We want it to be on demand. And so all of the old certainties, all of the old realities that, that many of us um, uh, un- understand and and and. and engaged as in football in the first place they're very rapidly eroding and so we have to get used to the fact that moving forward from this point new generations of consumers will be looking for very different things and so the kind of uh, products that we're used to seeing in sport and, and in football will have to change in order to survive they do indeed uh, simon chadrick we are out of time but it was great to get you on the program thank you so much thank for you. joining us on counting the cost thank you now, Chile exports the lion's share of the world's alginate. It's found in the cell walls of brown seaweed and is widely used in everyday products, including cosmetics. The algae grows in underwater forests off Chile's long coastline. But as Lucia Newman reports from Pichicui, it's now in danger due to a growing black market in illegal harvesting. At a glance, it's obvious that planet Earth is more water than land. At first, it looks like there's nothing, but underneath, there is extraordinary biodiversity. One trunk of algae can sustain more than 400 species. There are snails, sea urchins, anemone. It's where life begins. These are mackerel algae forests, as indispensable for our survival as those that grow above ground. Through photosynthesis, they absorb just as much CO2 gas, and together with phytoplankton and seagrass, they produce nearly half of our planet's oxygen. They're also like nurseries for small fish to find shelter from predators. Along 2,000 kilometers of Chile's Pacific coast, these forests can grow 40 meters high and live for up to 25 years. But they are in danger. There are areas, especially in the north, where the algae is being extracted indiscriminately. Almost every day, Maria Campos walks onto the edge of these rocks to catch huido, as it's called in Chile. It's hard work, but its escalating price has allowed her to send her three children to university. These widows or algae are drying out here so that they can then be taken off to be sold. And why is this algae in such high commercial demand? Because they are the source of alginate. You probably have never heard of it, but believe me, you have consumed it. This is used for making your car's dashboards. It's the most expensive type. This variety is used for making creams, shampoos, and soaps. And this one, called the black widow, is used in making the plastics that we use practically every day. It's also used widely in the cosmetic industry. From here, it's taken to a processing plant to be chopped and shipped, primarily to China and Japan. Chile produces 40% of the world's alginate, but much of it is harvested illegally. Maria Campos says she only takes what the ocean throws out. This is what we call the head of the tree. The ocean threw it out to shore because it was no longer needed. This isn't the same wiro that the boat extracts. The fishermen dive, cut it out from the head, and kill it. Licensed fishermen are allowed to rip out the algae, a technique that was illegal until 1980. Last year, 500 tons were exported, half of it harvested without authorization in a thriving black market. Chile's long coastline makes it difficult to police. But there are other ways to help turn the tide. Like assistance, for example, from seeding or uh, regrowth of the plant in terrestrial environments and then put it back in the water. It requires an investment, yes. 
But employing science to counter the depletion of natural species has already become a necessity. So that, as Darwin once said, we don't all perish. Lucia Newman, Al Jazeera, Pichicui, Chile. And that is our show for this week. But there's more for you online at aljazeera.com slash ctc. That'll take you straight to our page, which has entire episodes for you to catch up on. Well, that's it for this edition of Counting the Cost. I'm Halima Hidin and the whole team. Thanks for joining us. The news on Al Jazeera is next. <laughs>